something has always bothered me about the sustainer of heavenly principles. Why doesn't she just kill the travelers? I'm sure she could if she really put her mind to it. After all, not even the twins working together at full strength could make the sustainer move even a micrometer from her chosen position. She could easily kill them, but she doesn't. Instead, she's weirdly persistent about ensuring the twins make contact with her little red boxes. But why? What's so special about these little boxes anyway? Well, maybe with a little digging, we can find out exactly what's up with these boxes and maybe what's inside. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Opera GX. I've personally been using the standard Opera browser as my browser of choice for over 10 years now, which should tell you how much I love it. Opera GX is everything I love about the Opera browser, but better. For starters, I have terrible internet, which makes playing an online game like Genshin a little bit difficult if I'm also like, you know, doing something in the background. Opera GX doesn't make my net any faster, but it does help me manage how much bandwidth all my open tabs use while I'm doing in-game research, building characters, or just tracking down materials using the interactive map, which is helpful. But if you have good internet but a potato computer, you can tell Opera GX exactly how much RAM and CPU it's allowed to utilize. No more browsers stealing precious computing power from your games! Now, if you're anything like me and you also want to stream music or podcasts while you play, even on potato internet, Opera GX has all of that built into the browser itself, so you don't have to click through tabs anymore to manage your music. Just click the stream tab and boom, done. Music, it's excellent. And if cosmetics are your thing, Opera GX has got you covered. There's completely customizable color options and even a ton of free animated wallpapers for your speed dial. Yeah, snazzy. All of this and we barely scratched the surface when it comes to this browser's features, so just uh, go on down to that description box and click the link there to check out all of the other offerings and take Opera GX for a test drive. It's free, so no subscriptions, no payment plans, it's totally free. You are absolutely going to love this browser as much as you're going to love the rest of this video. So thanks once again to Opera GX for sponsoring this theory, and now back to the video. Ah, but as always, a quick disclaimer before we begin. This is a theory video, which basically makes it a glorified opinion piece. Emphasis on the opinion part. I do my best to make sure all the information that is not my opinion or speculation is as accurate as possible. Because of that, you can find citations and links for further reading in the description box, as well as corrections, annotations, and additional information in the pinned comment. And that said, this video as a whole is full of speculation, so please don't take everything I say here as canonical information. I strongly encourage you to double check my work and do your own research and draw your own conclusions, all right? Okay, so with that out of the way, let's turn our attention back to the sustainer of heavenly principles, whose name is far too long and annoying to say over and over again, so I will hereby dub her Susty. Alrighty, so Susty here actually makes three appearances in the game so far, or at least her boxes make three appearances. We see her once at the very beginning of the game, and then we see her cubes on two other occasions once during the We Will Be Reunited trailer over the ruins of Conria, and again during the Electro Archon quest when Raiden A remembers Conria's fall as well. We'll start with the scene at the very beginning of the game. Susty first declares that mankind has committed arrogation. Now, to arrogate means to seize without justification, or perhaps more accurately, to assert one's right to possess something or perform an action. In this context, I've taken this to mean that mankind has laid claim to something that doesn't actually belong to them, whether that be knowledge, power, or even a title. Kind of like if someone just declared themselves to be king without having any true right to the throne. It's that kind of thing. After this declaration, she stops the twins from leaving. From this, I have drawn two assumptions. First, as we've previously established, mankind has committed a great sin in Susty's eyes and deserves some form of punishment. Theoretically, this statement is referring to Conria directly since it was being destroyed at the time she says this to the twins, but we'll come back to this idea. Second, Susty thinks that we're human. See, if Susty recognized us as gods properly, then there would be no need to stop us from leaving Tavat. 
But if we're humans, she might have a problem with us leaving the realm of her control. All that said, I guess the real question is, what exactly was this irrigation? I'm not entirely certain myself, but I do have some ideas. Albedo asks us in the Shadows Emit Snowstorms event if the act of creation is an act of irrigation. Given that the term irrigation is used very deliberately here, and that Albedo asks us about it in terms of alchemy, I can't help but feel like these two statements are linked. Remember that Chemia is a unique form of alchemy developed by the godless nation of Conria, and Susti obliterated Conria, and it's during Conria's fall that we once again see Susti's powers at play in the form of those little red boxes. Rhine Daughter, Conrian alchemist and the one who created Albedo and taught him everything he knows, left Albedo behind with the singular instruction of show me the truth of this world. In light of that, maybe focusing on the act of creation as irrigation is not quite right. Instead, it might be that through the act of creation, one can learn a certain truth, and knowledge of that truth may be something considered to belong only to the gods. By learning said truth, mankind may claim ownership of it, resulting in an act of irrigation. Keep this in mind because we'll look into what this truth could be a little later on. Now, if all of that is true, and the sustainer is merely enforcing this rule that the truth only belongs to the divine, then it's possible that Conria, or someone there, learned of this and spread this knowledge. So, what's all this got to do with the little red boxes? I want to reiterate the fact that Susti herself hasn't actually killed anyone, at least not on screen and not that we've seen. So I'm kind of wondering if killing goes against her title and responsibilities as a sustainer, but that might be a bit of a reach. Susti's methods appear to be more control and contain than seek and destroy, at least when it comes to human life. In my effort to try and figure out what exactly Susty was trying to do with Conria, I spent way too much time staring at Conria's fall, looking for anything that could give me some insight. And then I had a realization. If Susty's goal or responsibility is to contain things, then those boxes must be containers, which sounds really obvious now that I say it out loud. So riddle me this. When a disaster is headed for a city, what generally happens to the people? Answer, they are evacuated. So what's in the box? People. Well, more specifically, the souls of people. Let me explain. For the longest time, theorists have assumed that hilly churls are in fact people turned into monsters. They have a language, tribes, different cultures based on region, relationships, and more. Plus, they're very humanoid in comparison to our other monster-based enemy types. Now here's the thing. Hilly churls have existed for thousands of years and no one has ever explained where they came from. Many people theorize that they could have been the former people of Conria that were cursed and therefore turned into monsters, but Conria was destroyed a mere 500 years ago. The timeline doesn't add up. However, the hilly trail population apparently exploded around 500 years ago, which does line up. That means it's very possible that hilly trails are at least partly made up of people of Conria while others turned into abysslings. The latter was confirmed, after all, during the We Will Be Reunited quest and, uh, you know, and Konomiya. But a curse seems kind of weird in context, although I can't quite articulate why. It just never sat right with me, but consider this. Hilly trills lack faces behind their masks. They lack names and identities. They appear to be capped at only a certain level of mental function, which made me wonder. What if hilly trills are just people who no longer possess ownership of their souls? Yeah, it's messed up six ways to Sunday on like 20 different levels, but like, hear me out. If Susty really wanted to ensure that no truth would ever be known to the humans, she would ensure that those who had contact with the truth would never be able to comprehend it. But she doesn't kill them. She traps their souls in a box, allowing their mortal body to continue eking out its life in perfect 
ignorance. Do I have evidence for this? Yes, absolutely. Watch Susty here when Ether attacks her with his full power. She doesn't block his attack. She doesn't deflect it. She doesn't nullify it. She actually contains it. Her cubes capture the ability and then they congregate at one singular cube, which then in turn encapsulates Ether and warps him somewhere. Now look at the symbol on the cube. I know I've called it an eye many, 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 many times in the past, but it might not be an eye at all, or at least not just an eye. It might actually be a fruit, an earminsel fruit. Uh, okay, okay, maybe I can't prove this within a shadow of a doubt, but hear me out on this one. This is an image from a mural within the world level ascension domain, within the energy amplifier event domain, and in the third floor of the spiral abyss. It appears to depict a plant of some sort, but every branch or vine ends in the same leaf-shaped symbol with a dot in the center. It looks slightly different from the one on Susty's cubes, but it's the same general shape, enough to get me suspicious, and that's what got me thinking about these as potentially fruits or things that grow off of plants. If you compare this shape with one of the Irminsul fruit fragment slots on the energy amplifier itself, they have a remarkable resemblance as well. And if we assume that this video is even remotely accurate in assuming that constellations of Teyvat are actually Irminsul fruit and Irminsul fruit not only define destinies but contain powerful memories, it's possible still that some Irminsul fruit actually contain the souls of people. After all, people have to go through the ley lines in order to be reborn. Their soul has to go somewhere during that time, right? Now, if you've watched my video on Ryan Daughter, you might remember me talking about how glass blowing could be a metaphor for blowing a soul into the body, as per the Old Testament and the Talmud. We then concluded that Ryan Daughter may not have been trying to recreate a human body so much as she was trying to recreate the human soul. That would have been one of the goals in the Primordial Human Project, of which Albedo is one part of. You remember how I said we were going to talk about that whole truth thing that Susty wanted to keep quiet? This is it, okay? Now, in the Talmud, an important Jewish text, it says that Adam, who you probably know as the first man, was initially a golem, or a being in the shape of a man formed from clay. What made this golem into a human was the act of God breathing a soul into its body. You know, it's been heavily rumored in Jewish mysticism that some rabbi have maintained the ability to craft golems as well, but because they are not God and they do not possess the powers of God, they cannot give it a soul, and therefore it behaves more like an automaton than a person. It can't talk, it can't think, it just follows orders. For, you know, if one were to breathe a soul into a golem, one might then become too much like God, right? Now, if Ryan Daughter, or Conria in general, was able or capable of manipulating, creating, or altering souls at some level, then that could be part of a power reserved only for the divine and therefore knowledge that Susti sought to contain. Thus, she seized the souls of the Conrian people, leaving them with nothing more than their ignorant bodies. And we call them hilly churls. Those who escaped became abysslings through some other process that I don't really know how to go through. We're, we're not going to talk about that right now, okay? Anyway, why would Susty even have this power is the real question here. I think Susty rules over the world tree and may be playing the role of the goddess Arianrod. If you're not familiar with Arianrod, I talk about her a lot in this video, but essentially she's a Welsh goddess that governs over life and death, has an ever-shifting labyrinth of a castle that exists within an otherworldly field that you can access through a doorway and a reef, which should sound an awful lot like the Spiral Abyss, right? And the icon for the Spiral Abyss is a tree, and I've even gone so far as to theorize that the Spiral Abyss exists within the world tree itself. Since the world tree sustains the world of Teyvat, then it wouldn't be remiss to suggest that the sustainer of heavenly principles may be the owner of the tree itself, or the guardian of it so much, you know, which makes her a lot like Arianrod. Anyway, where does Celestia fit into all this? 
Well, Celestia is interesting because they appear to be trying to buck the natural order by allowing humans to circumvent the natural cycle of death and rebirth. If you've watched this video of mine where I talk about how the omnipresent god is connected to the staff of Homa and the battle pass and how those symbols are all related to the Homa bird, then you're probably able to see where I'm going next. If you haven't, here's what you need to know. Basically, in Genshin, heaven is associated with birds. Homa birds specifically, but mostly just birds. While hell or the underworld is associated with snakes and dragons, as very explicitly illustrated in the region of Enkonomiya. Watch this video if you want to learn more, but in the interest of time, we just need the connection between heaven and birds and hell and snakes. Okay? Now, going back to Jewish mysticism, there is something called the guff it's basically like a treasury of souls, or alternatively, it is called a tree of souls. There is a long-standing Jewish and Arabic belief that souls themselves are likened to birds and are even said to take the shape of ghostly birds flying through the sky. These bird-like souls were said to rest in the guff, which was described as a birdhouse, or alternatively, a columbarium. Now, the columbarium connection is what I want to focus on here because this is a picture of the San Francisco columbarium, while this is a picture of the inside of Celestia. And if you're wondering, a columbarium is a building that houses funerary urns. Columba being Latin for dove and columbarium is often used as a name for like dovecots or pigeon nesting boxes as well. So a birdhouse for dead people. This means that Celestia may not be a prison, as per the popular panopticon theory, but instead a warehouse of souls, an artificial guff, if you will. This also kind of explains why Vanessa re-enters the world in the form of a bird, and why she was so shocked when she entered Celestia in the first place. So what did Susty do to the twins at the beginning of the game? I bet you're also wondering that, aren't you? Well, working under the assumption that the twins are not humans, it may be safe to assume that they do not possess a soul in the typical mortal sense. If that's the case, then Susty may not have been able to contain them at all. When she first captures Lumine in this scene, she examines the cube and her expression changes very slightly. It's possible that this cube was mostly empty. So curious about what went wrong, she repeats the process on Ether, but was unable to contain him properly as well. But that doesn't mean her attempt was completely ineffective. If the twins don't have a body and soul independent from one another, it may be that their body and soul are one and the same. So if Susty tried to capture their soul by separating it from their body, failure would have been inevitable. However, I think Susty was able to shatter Ether and Lumine into pieces fragments. Over time, they would slowly reassemble themselves, but at very different rates. So one twin would wake up long before the other simply because the other had all of their pieces maybe closer together, or perhaps they were collected by the Abyss Order. So the Abyssal twin was therefore able to retain the majority of their powers since they more or less have all of their pieces, while the Traveler is still tracking down their missing pieces and obtaining them one by one through the statues of seven within each nation. I think there's far more to this concept than just what I've discussed in this video, but I think I'll leave it here for now. Whether this symbol depicts an eye, a fruit, or both, I am personally convinced that the sustainer's cubes contain the souls of people who know a bit too much. I mean, isn't it suspicious that Kaya, our resident Conria Cataclysm survivor, tells this cute little story about souls being trapped inside these box-shaped lanterns? I think he knows something. But what do you guys think is in this box? Is it a soul, a world, a bubble universe, or are these cubes just the shape of the sustainer's power and there's nothing inside of them at all? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, but you know what, that's all for me for now, so take care guys! Thank you all so very much for watching, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.